praise the Lord from Pastor Strader at Lighthouse Church. Thanks for connecting with us through our podcast. Our prayer is that it's a blessing to you as we try to reach, equip, and mobilize Jesus' name disciples in Apache Junction, Arizona, and the surrounding region. Enjoy today's podcast and come back often. God bless you. We love you. God. If you have your Bibles and you would turn with me to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 23, amen. If you are here for the first time, I want you to know that you're invited as well to our lunch. In fact, we would be greatly appreciative if you would stay and fellowship with us. We'd love to get to meet you and talk with you for a little bit and know that we have Sunday night service here 5.30 is our pre-service prayer. 6 p.m. is our evening service. And uh, God moves on Sunday nights. He moves on Sunday mornings. And he moves on Wednesday nights. Amen. Praise God. So uh, Monday night, sister. Yes, he does. Praise God. So you don't want to, you don't want to, you want to be here tonight. You want to be here tonight because God's going to do something great. And we invite you to join us, 5.30 prayer, 6 o'clock service. Numbers 23 and verse 19. Everyone say it with me. God God is not a man. Man, we could just stop right there and preach until tonight. We won't do that. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said... So I say, has God spoken? And shall he, God, not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Praise God. I want to talk on this topic. Has God spoken? Has God spoken? Can we lift our hands one more time? And let's just thank God for what God's about to do in our hearts. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate you, God. For all that you're about to do, open up our hearts to hear the word. We thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Thank you for your worship today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Has God spoken? You don't have to raise your hands, but I want to ask the question, who enjoys waiting? I imagine there would be very few hands raised, if any hands raised, to that question, do you enjoy waiting? But they say that if it's worth having, it's worth waiting for. (laughs) That's what they say. If it's worth having, it's worth waiting for. Uh, I'm just going to be honest. I've shared this before. I hate to wait. If anything I hate to do, if my attitude comes out really on anything, it's going to be if I have to wait. Well, glory. I know I'm the only one. But I hate waiting in traffic. We were going to California and we hit traffic in Buckeye. And I'm sitting there with a smile on my face trying to convince myself that I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm thankful. And uh, I'm just smiling, you know, like, oh, I should be happy, but this traffic has got me annoyed. And uh, I hate to be late. I'm a planner, and I, I like to have a, an idea of what we're going to do. And when I put something on paper that I'm going, this is when we're going to leave, or this is when I need to be there, uh, to me, now this is how I feel. If you are not five minutes early, you're late. We need mm, we need to take that mentality to church. If you are not here five minutes early, you're late. I realize I didn't get any amens to that. But the reality is, is that I feel that, and I'm going off the track here, but I feel that. Um, when someone is late for something, that it, they have deemed it unimportant. 
Now, I've been late to several things before. <laughs> Hopefully, I've not been late to anything that you've planned <laughs> because surely I'm not saying that it was unimportant. But just in my mind, especially when it comes to the house of God, is that there needs to be proper preparation. And, uh, and so that's why we get here early for prayer. I said that's why we get here early for prayer. Because there are some things that we need to take care of before the piano and the organ and the drums and the voices begin to sing and to, and to play. But I, I got to get back on track. I don't even know why I started on that. Because I, I guess, I, yeah, I hate traffic. I hate waiting. Uh, I, I hate being in lines and waiting. In fact, I tell my wife all the time, I don't need it that bad. I'll just go home. I don't have to. I don't. I'll, you know, I would rather sit and wait for them to do something than to wait in line to do that same. Th- I don't know. It's just it's something in my head. I just don't like to wait. Um, but we wait in traffic. We wait in carpool lines. We wait in holding patterns. We wait in grocery store lines. We wait for the doctor. You. Oh, this one here might get me in trouble. You wait for your spouse. And every second I delay, I'm more in trouble. You wait for a, you wait for your children. Man, this one this one gets me. Hey, we're we're getting out of the car. Five minutes later, we're all out of the car. My goodness, we're just getting out of the car. You wait for retirement. You wait for sermons to be over. <laughs> and we wait for Jesus to return. Waiting on God however, is not only difficult, sometimes it seems impossible. We want things to happen in our own timing, according to our plans, our way or the highway. But let me just establish something with the things of God, is it's not your way or the highway. It's just not. In fact, we need to get that 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 thinking out of our mind that it is not my way or the highway. I say, Lord, however you have formed it in heaven, you just read, read, read the Psalms. How, how, teach us to pray. However you have formed it in heaven, let us realize it here on earth. As it has been formed in heaven, let me realize it in my life. How you have planted it in heaven, let me realize it in my family, in my marriage, in my finances, in my job, in my church, in everything that I do. However you have done it, let it be your will, not my will. Less of me, more of you. You get the point. It's not my way. It's his way. But God doesn't operate on our schedules. And expecting that he will sets us up for a major disappointment. <clears throat> Waiting on God means going without answers to prayer. Do I have any witnesses on that? Anybody going to help me preach today? I said when waiting on God means getting going on without answers to prayer. I don't know about you, but I've gone sometimes years. I'm still going on years of praying and still waiting for God. Wondering why the wicked seem to prosper in spite of. Man, that gets you sometimes. If you allow your flesh to take over, well, why do they get it, but I don't? Why do they, why do, why did God give it to them, but not to me? Have I done something wrong? Oh, we. Now, I'm just, this is how I, I've just, this is me. Maybe this is not how you think sometimes, but I'm just, I'm, I'm flesh. And so I think, why, why, God, what am I doing wrong? Why are you giving it? Why, why do they seem to get it? But it, am I out of alignment, or, or have I done something, or 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 just you know why? <laughs> why do the wicked seem to prosper? I've always you know some people say, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God this. No, we won't. We won't. It won't even matter at that point. But it sure sounds good down here. Yeah. And one of the things that I've I've scratched my head on is knowing families and friends and my own family who have struggled to have children. But yet, there's plenty of wicked people that seem to have children every year. And I, I, I ponder and I wonder, God, why is that? Why don't you answer that prayer? 
And so it's difficult sometimes, and having desires delayed and hope deferred, God has a greater perspective on life events, and His perspective, plans, and schedules are perfect and holy because He is perfect and He is holy. We've got to remember that. I said He is perfect and He is holy. Psalm 19, 18 and 30, as, as for God, His way, not my way, His way Help me out. Is perfect. His way, not my way, is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. If God's ways are perfect, then we can trust that whatever he does and whatever his timing is, is also perfect. It may go against what we want. It may go against how we think it should come together, but his ways are perfect. His timing is perfect. When we grasp the fact that waiting on God is not only made less difficult, when we get that idea that God's ways are perfect, it not only becomes less difficult, but it actually becomes joyful. Now, how can waiting be joyful? Only in the arms of God can it be joyful for some circumstances and predicaments, you say. But when you really know that God is in control of it all, you can say, I trust him. I trust him. And I've got joy. I may not like it, but I've got joy. I may not even agree with it, but I've still got joy. It doesn't mean I don't hurt, but I've got joy. Waiting is not just something that we have to do while we get what we want. And here is, herein lies the problem, is that when we are in a waiting period of time and God has spoken to us, has anybody, you don't have to raise your hand, but has anybody got a prophetic word from God ever in your life? Maybe it's by somebody else, or maybe it's you've heard it directly from God, or you've read it in the word and God said, that is directly for you. And every word is for you, but you know what I mean. You begin to read it and like, that's it. That is what God, he, he, he's writing me a check, if you will. That is from God. Anybody ever had that before? Oh, I've had that before. And God has spoken to me, or God has, God has spoken to me with somebody else. He's confirmed it with somebody else. Or God speaks, and, and then they begin to sing a song that says exactly what God spoke. And it's like, man, God just keeps speaking. The problem is, is that while we are waiting, it's not just to wait until we get what we want. God makes us wait or has us wait to try us sometimes. Waiting is the process of becoming what God wants us to be. What God, what God does in us while we wait is as important as what God is going to do and what we are waiting for. That process of waiting is so vitally important. I think of life as seasons. We go from season to season to season, and I also think of life as as territories. We, God gives us this territory and then we're supposed to go to this territory and we're kind of moving from territory, from season to season, territory to territory and, and God's saying, okay, I want to get you to that season but before I can get you to that season, I've got to teach you some things in this season. Right, you know why they say it's, why it's long suffering? Because it's long and it's suffering. <laughs> I don't like it. I'm sure you don't like it either. But to get that fruit, that long suffering, it's going to be long and it's going to be a lot of suffering. And so in that process of waiting, God begins to do something in our hearts and in our spirits and in our attitudes and and in our way of thinking and in our prayer life and in our, our, our devotion to him. And what God does in us while we wait is important. Waiting, biblical waiting, is not passive waiting. It's not just passively waiting around for something to happen. Well, God's given me a word. God's made me a promise. I'm going to sit here on the recliner until God does it. No, sir, no, ma'am. That is not what God desires. Well, I'm not going to make a move until God does that. No, that's not what God desires. That's not what he's trying to do. You've got to read your word. You've got to find the stories that, that show you otherwise. It's not being passive or waiting for something to happen that will allow us to escape our current trouble. Waiting does not mean doing nothing. 
And the problem with our seasons that we get into this waiting period, we become apathetic. We become kind of lethargic. We kind of become kind of uh, insensitive. We become jaded to the spirit and the presence of God because we keep hearing the word and we haven't seen the promise. But God's saying, I've got you in a waiting period. I'm trying to teach you something. And what I pray is, God, teach me quick so I don't have to be here long. I'm a fast learner, God. I'm a fast learner. And help me to be a fast learner. Get through this thick skull, what you've got, or this thick heart of mine, that what you need to get in me because i got to get out of this. But let me tell you that some of the most precious moments with God They only happen. They only happen in that time of waiting. I hate it. I hate that. I hate that sometimes it has to be that way. But some of the most precious times with God, the deepest roots that go deep into the Word of God happen in these times of of waiting for the spoken word. That's when you get reliant on God. You have to be. I can't rely on anybody else. I have to rely on God because he's the one that spoke it. Man can't do this. God's the only one that can do it. And so it's in these moments that we can learn, that we can trust in God, that we can begin uh, to to, to really get close to God. I've got to tell you, some of the greatest times of God have been the hardest times of my life. I said some of the greatest times with God have been the hardest times of my life. I look back and I think, I would not wish that season on anybody. I I see seasons of my family that I'm thinking, I don't wish that season on anybody. And I began to pray for them. We began to we began to intercede for them because my my I just don't I can't understand. How do you make it without God? I really don't understand how people do it without the Lord. But we began to plead the blood. But the greatest, the most defining moments of my relationship with God have unfortunately, I suppose, happened in this season of waiting for a promise. But biblical waiting is not passive and waiting around for something to happen. But waiting, and waiting does not mean not doing nothing. It is not a, uh, it is not a a a resignation of life. It's not a resignation of worship or prayer or devotion or faithfulness. It is not a way to evade unpleasant reality. We can get this woe is me type of spirit or woe is me type of attitude because we're in a waiting period and we we see everybody else prospering. We see everybody else getting a promise and, and we get this woe as me spirit and woe as me attitude. Listen. You don't know what they're going through. You, you, you may, you, you, all you see is the Facebook post. All you see is what's on social media. But what you don't see is what they're dealing with at night. What you don't see is what they're battling in their family. What you don't know is what they're battling with their, in their, within their own mind, within their own head. They could also be in a season of waiting. Those who wait on those are those who work. I'll say that again. Those who wait are those who work because they know that their work is not in vain. I'm going to tell you, when God gives me a promise, God begins to speak to me about something. God said, I'm going to tell you, you can take it to the bank and you can cash it. It's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. It will come to pass. In fact, I I preached the other night, it is done. It's finished. When God says it, it's done. You can put a you can put it, put it again, take it to the bank and cash it. You can count on it. When God gives a word, it is already done. I don't care if you can see it yet or not. It's finished. It's done. It's completed. When God says the word, I don't care what no man, what any man does. There is no door that God opens that man can shut. Somebody hear that. There is no door that a man can shut that God has opened and vice versa. There is no door that man can open that God shuts. And we need to, we need, this is a whole different message, but we need to become more comfortable with the word no. We don't like that word no, but we need to become more comfortable with the word no. Because I'm going to tell you what, the word no has saved me more times than yes. (laughs) Sometimes I've prayed for things and God says no. Or not right now. Or 
Never. Thanks be to God for that. Thanks be to God for that. Those who wait are those who work. Think about the farmer. We can wait all summer for his harvest. The farmer can wait all that time for his harvest. Why is he waiting all that time? He's not worried about it. He's, not, he, he's kind of watching after it, but he's, he knows. The reason he's not worrying about it is because he knows that he's put in the work of sowing the seed and that the law of harvest is I will reap what I will sow. I got to gotta address something really quick. Again, this is another rabbit trail, but I just feel it. You need to understand that sometimes you say, well, man, why is all this uh, problems happening in my life? Why, why does it seem like the moment I get, start giving my life to God, the moment that I start doing, trying to do good, trying to pray more, trying to worship more, trying to be faithful more, that it, it just seems like opposition rises up? Yep. Absolutely. That's what happens. Because before you weren't on Satan's radar. But now you're on Satan's radar, and he's going to be after you. Another thing is you reap what you sow. And so if you have years of, re- of sowing uh, wickedness, you're going to sow even after you come into the church, after you give your life to God, after you're trying to make things right. I, unfortunately, you're going to reap some things of the past. God just can't, I mean, he can, but a lot of times he just doesn't wipe that away. Sometimes he does, but a lot of times he says, no, there's still a, a learning that I'm going to teach you in that, in that season. And you know why? Because sometimes if we don't go through some things, we really don't appreciate it. We really don't appreciate it. I don't know how you pray, but I pray like this. God, thank you for the things that you've kept from me that I have no clue about. I mean, the sicknesses that I did have, but you healed me, and I had no clue. The times that I would have been dead, but you kept me, and I had no clue. The times that you protected my wife and my kids, and I had no idea what would have happened. I thank God for what he has kept me from. And so we, we can't get this attitude or this spirit, well, bless God, I, I'm, just, I'm just reaping all kinds of horrible things. Well, uh, what have you been sowing lately? Those who wait on God can go about their assigned tasks, confident that God will provide the meaning and the conclusion to their lives and to the harvest uh, to their toil. Waiting is the confident, disciplined, expectant, active, and sometimes painful clinging to God. It knows what we will reap. It knows we will reap a reward because we are trusting in God. We are leaning not on our own understanding, but on God's understanding. And when Jesus told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem, he was telling them that this was a means of experiencing his peace. He said, I want you to go wait in Jerusalem. I want you to experience my peace, my prosperity, my his, God's power. In waiting, they would catch the wind of God's spirit. In waiting, they would see God move. In waiting. Well... That went over like a lead balloon. I said, when you are waiting on God, that is some of the most powerful moves of God. We don't like that. We don't don't want to receive that. But I'm telling you that that moment of waiting, that season of waiting, when you will put your total trust and dependence and confidence on a God that's able to provide everything, and you just say, you know what, I know what you've spoken to me, God. I don't, it may happen in a year. It may happen in six months. It may not happen until five years. But, friend, if God speaks to you, it's done. Why? Because God keeps his promises. I said, God keeps his promises. There are two ways to wait. All of us will wait passively or will wait expectantly. A passive person hopes something good will happen and is willing to sit around waiting to see if it does. You see, there's a lot of promises that God's given this church. There's a lot of promises God's given you. I don't know all of them. You, you do, but I can tell you some of the promises God's given this church over the years. And, and uh, I'm going to tell you, we're not just going to sit here and twiddle our thumbs waiting on the promise. But we're moving forward. We got to take, we got to take land. We got to move forward. We got to, we got to possess some things. We got to do some work. Just because God's given us a promise doesn't mean we can't, we have to stop working. And I'm a firm believer if we want God to give us something greater, something grander, something, whatever it is, then God's got to learn that he can trust us with what's in our hand. 
if God can trust us with what's in our hand, then he says, I can trust you with something greater. But as long as we will, as long as we continue to minimize what's in our hand, God says, well, I guess that's all you'll have because you, I can't trust you with what you've got. This is all about waiting. After a short time, that person that passively is waiting for something to happen, after a short time, he, he gives up and saying, that's it, I've waited, I've, I've waited and nothing's happened. The passive person has a lot of wishbone but not a lot of backbone. And I'm going to tell you what, we need as apostolics, as one God apostolic, we need some, some, we need some backbone in us. We need some backbone because we got the word of God in us. We got the word right here. When God speaks, we need to say, hey, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the politicians say. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what they mock. If God said it, he's coming back, he's coming back. We need some backbone about us. The expectant person, on the other hand, is hopeful, believing the answer is just around the corner, due to arrive any minute. His or her belief is not a passive thing. Their heart is full of hope, expecting their problem to be solved at any moment. They wake up every morning expecting to find the answer. They may wait, and they may wait, and they may wait. It may wait for five years. It may be however long. But suddenly what he has been waiting for happens. I said, suddenly it happens. Now, Paul and Silas, they were waiting in jail, but they had a suddenly in their life. And suddenly, you see, we, sometimes we probably would have given up. Well, I'm, I'm in chains. I've been beaten. I'm, I mean, I'm, not, I'm just, I'm about borderline dead, and I'm here in this, this prison cell bound. I have no hope. There's nobody coming for us. Nobody can get in. Nobody's getting out. And, and you know what? Sometimes we get in this waiting period. We kind of get in this mopey period. We get in this long face period. And I said the other day, I'm going to say it again, but if you have the Holy Ghost living inside of you, you ought to be the happiest person on this side of heaven. I realize you meant that everything's not perfect. I realize things may be falling apart. I realize that plans may not be happening the way that you planned it. I realize you may have had some things done wrong to you. I understand all of that. But I've come to tell you, if you've got the Holy Ghost, we ought to have a smile on our faces. Because we've, given, we've got the joy of the Holy Ghost. And I believe we need to start acting like what we have on the inside. Because how, does, how is somebody else going to want the Holy Ghost if we're all running around moping? And sad and negative and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. Now, everybody needs to be vulnerable. You, you know, you need to have that, that person you can be vulnerable to. I'm not suggesting that. But I've come to tell you, if you're, if you're having a bad day that goes on to weeks or months, there's a problem somewhere. We need to get down. We need to get a little bit of a backbone about us. We need to get down in prayer. We need to fast. I think I, I can't remember, I, I said this about a month ago, but I'm going to tell you the greatest formula to heartache, to sadness, to depression, to anxiety, to questions, to weariness, it's prayer and fasting. You can't have one without the other. You can't do one and not the other, but you got to have both. And I mean, sometimes you got to go on some extended fasts. Because we got to crucify this flesh. We got to get it under subjection. We got we to get rid of this flesh, and that's the best way. And I'm not talking about just fasting social media or fasting this, or I'm talking about food fasts. Well, the enemy don't like that, but it's truth anyhow. But God keeps his promises. I've got to, you've got to make up in your mind, I'm not going to be a passive person while waiting. I'm not going to be someone that just stands around, mopes around, but I'm going to be an expectant person. Because I got the Holy Ghost. I got a promise. I got the joy. I've got something that this world does not have. You see, we, we sing that song and we say that statement, God, uh, what's that song? It was, uh, the Lord gave it to me and the world can't take it away. Uh, you're a worship leader. You're supposed to know these songs. I'm just kidding. I'm just picking. I, I'm supposed to know them too. Uh, he said, well, you're the pastor. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. We, we, you know, we sing that song sometimes. The world didn't give me the Holy Ghost, and the world can't take it away. No, but we give it to them a lot. We put our joy and our peace and our everything right on a platter for the enemy to take because we don't really have the joy. We really don't have the joy of the Holy Ghost. 
but you don't understand what I'm going through. I, I realize we've all got problems. We all got situations. We all got circumstances, and I'm not discrediting those. I'm not trying to de- I'm not trying to minimize those, but I've come to tell you, if you've got a promise, friend, uh, you need to rejoice. You need to rejoice, and you need to make up in your mind, I'm not going to be passive. I'm not just going to be mopey. I'm not just going to uh, go around sad and, 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 and kind of weary, but I'm going to rejoice, and I'm going to praise, and I'm going to be expecting it to happen. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. For all the promises of God are in him, yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. In Joshua 21 and 43, we see God's grace abound toward Israel uh, despite their rebellion, their disobedience, and their unbelief. He keeps his promises and eventually leads them into the land he promised them from the very beginning. I don't have time to go through the whole story, but I've just got to tell you that we need to learn that God is faithful on what he says he was going to do. If God says he's going to do it, friend, he's going to do it. I realize I may say I'm going to do something and I'm going to fail. I may say I'm going to do something and I'm going to mess up. I'm I'm going to fail it somewhere along the way. I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do as hard as I try. But I can tell you God is not a man that he would lie. If God said he's going to do it, it's going to come to pass. Who hasn't? Learn that our human promises are usually pretty flimsy. We promise many things, often the be- with the best intentions, yet so many of them come up so far short. Some say this product comes with a lifetime guarantee. Anybody ever bought a product that says lifetime guarantee? You know the question I ask with lifetime guarantees, what if that, pr- that business goes bankrupt? They do it all the time. That lifetime guarantee is gone. It's useless. Lifetime guarantee. Yeah, but you 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 closed the shop two years ago. There's no lifetime guarantee. But I've come to tell you of a God that when God tells you something, when God promises you something, when God gives you something, friend, I don't care what happens, he'll never close shop. He never goes bankrupt. He will do what he said he would do. I I don't care what the world says. I don't care what happens to you. I don't care how bad life gets. I don't know what's happened in your life, but I've come to tell you that God keeps his promises. And if he says he's going to do something, he's got the resources to back it up. I may not have the resources to back it up. The other other day, Brother... uh, brother, not Muse, but Brother Sparks was preaching. He said, I'll give you a million dollars if you can find this in the, in the Scripture. And I, I was thinking, well, I guess I could say that, but I, I couldn't give him a million dollars because I don't have a million dollars. But I, 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 could, I could maybe say a different amount. But if I tell you I'm gonna, I, I'd give you a million dollars if you can do this, it, it really has no, no authority at all because I ain't got it. I don't have it. I ain't got $100,000. To give you. But when God says it's yours, friend, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. I'm not just talking about dollars and cents. I'm talking about promises of God. When God has promised you something, He has the resources to back it up. When God makes a promise, He keeps it. He is the only one in the universe who is loyal and a reliable promise keeper. I don't know about you, but I know God as a promise keeper. He's a promise keeper, and he never changes. The Bible says in Hebrews uh, 13 and 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know about you, but God is a promise keeper. Anytime he's ever promised me anything, he's always come through. And surely there are some things he's promised that I've not yet seen come to pass. But friend, I'm telling you, I'm not waiting around passively, waiting for God to do it. I'm looking, I'm being expectant. I'm waking up. God, where's the building? God, where's the property? God, where's the souls? God, where's my lost family? God, where, where, where is it? You've promised it. And now we need to start proclaiming it. We need to shift our prayer. We need to shift it to uh, begging for it and praying for it to 
proclaiming it. I proclaim my lost family to be saved. Fill in the blank. I, I surely I can't go through everything, but you got to start speaking with different words and, and with some boldness and authority. Do we believe God can do anything or do we believe he is a man? But I've come to tell you he is not a man that he should lie, but God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Here, here's what I feel in the Holy Ghost right now. There's some people in here where you have, man has failed you. Man has let you down. And somehow they were tied to God. But let me tell you that if there is the word failure in relation to whatever it was that you experienced with God, that was not God at all. That was a lowercase g God. But the God that I serve, when you partner with the God of the universe, he is a promise keeper. I'm not saying that you won't ever have bad things happen because it rains on the just and the unjust alike. It happens to everybody. I hate it. But I've come to tell you, I would much rather walk through the valley of the shadow of death with God by my side than by myself. I don't want to walk through it at all. But if I have to go through it, I want him by my side because I don't know how else I would make it. Now, I don't know about you. You may have other plans and other ways, but I depend solely on God. I got to depend on Him when I don't understand it, when I, I don't have the answers. I've just got to depend on God. I've just got to lean on Him. I've just got to trust Him because I know He's a promise keeper. I know what He is. When He says He is something, He is it. When He says He's going to do it, He's going to do it. And what we need to learn is how to discern what is a promise from God, and what is our fleshly desire? Sometimes we, we feel something in our spirit, and I, I'm not wronging for you for this, but because it, it takes a lot of spiritual maturity and prayer, but sometimes we feel something, and that's really not God. That's us. That's what our desire is, and, and we want it so badly, and it seems so like a good thing to want. It's a, it's a pure thing to want. And so surely, why wouldn't God want to give that to me? Because it's not wrong. It's not evil. It's not bad. It, it seems like in my mind, in my head, that it's all good. So surely, I should proclaim it as a promise. But I'm telling you, we got to learn to have that spirit of discernment to know what is from God and what is from our own flesh. Because I've come to tell you that if it's from your flesh, it likely is going to fail. But when it comes directly from God, friend, it will never fail. It will never fail. It will never fail. I'm going to say it again. It will never fail. God is a promise keeper. He's, he's done it for me time and time again. I see hands being lifted right now. And what that, what that is, yes, I agree. He is a promise keeper. There have been times that I've been let down by my own expectation. But when God gives me his expectation, he comes through every single time. Romans 4 and 20, he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that, I love that, and being fully persuaded, everybody help me say it, fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. God spoke to Abraham through an angel. And he told him, even though it was, he was 100 years old, God would give him a son. Now that's crazy, folks. Right? That's crazy. God's going to give a 100-year-old a son? That's, that's laughable. <laughs> and she did. The angel's comment was so outrageous to Sarah, she burst out in laughter. But God was faithful to his word. When he said, Abraham, you're going to have a son, let me tell you, the son was already birthed. In the spirit, in, 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 the, in the thinking of God, in the, in the realm of which God operates, it was already done. It was done. It was finished. He was already born. As she was laughing, when God said it, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now here's where faith comes in. Most of us could wait nine months for God's promise to be fulfilled. Most of us could. Right? Nine months, that's a long time, but man, nine months, I can do nine months. 
Besides, after a little while, things would become evident that Sarah was pregnant with the promise. There would be physical changes that she's pregnant. Like, it's crazy, but she's pregnant. The promise that God gave, I can see it. I can we can we can we can pray for that 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 baby bump. I, we can we can maybe uh, f- they can feel the the hands pressing against that skin and and uh, perhaps uh, hear or or feel that heartbeat. However, the time between the original promise and the fulfillment was not nine months, but it was twenty five years. Twenty five. Years it took for that son to be birthed. I can wait nine months, but I don't know if I can wait 25 years. I'm telling you, I don't care how long. I don't care what happens. I don't care who tries to come against you. I don't care what they say about you. I don't care what, if God said it, friend, it's done. It may take 25 years, but that's where faith comes in. That's where you got to be expected. I don't know about you. That's a long time to hold on to a promise. But Abraham took God at his word and waiting 25 years to see it completed. And I have a feeling today that many of us give up too soon on the promises of God. And then we blame God why we don't see the promise. And I've come to tell you, it's because you've given up on the promise. We've given up on the promise. And God's saying, hey, I've given you something. Don't you think that I'm not a God of my word, but I am a God of my word. If I told you it's going to happen, it will happen. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I feel the Holy Ghost. I want us to lift our hands right now. I'm finished, but God's not done right now. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's all stand if you would. I've got more, but I feel at the end that right here. I said I have a feeling that we give up too soon on God. Because just because he didn't fulfill it on our timetable, just because he hasn't done it on our schedule, just because he didn't do it when I thought he was going to do it, doesn't mean that God is not faithful to his word. But faith believes that what God said, he will do. That's what faith does. That's what faith is. Faith says, I don't know how, I don't know when, but if God said it, he, it is done. There's that song. If, if he said it, I believe it, it is done. If he said it, I believe it, it is done. When God makes a promise, he is faithful to fulfill that promise. You see, God's word and his character are connected. He must keep his word. And faith holds on to that promise until it is realized. The more that you trust in God, the stronger your faith grows. God always fulfills His promise, but it's always on His timetable. In Abraham's case, he held on to that promise for 25 years. And you heard it when I read it. Verse, If you would, Sister Angela, maybe pull it verse 21 again of, of Romans so we can just we can just see it for ourselves. But he said he was fully persuaded. He was fully persuaded. There was no convincing him because he heard the word from God. How many times does God got to persuade you that he's God? What does God got to do? Does he literally got to go up to you every service and shake you and convince you, I'm God. I've got this. I've got it under control. If I made a promise, no, 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 no. We got to get this in this in our head. We got to get it in our heart. We got to get it in our spirit. I am fully persuaded that if God said it, it is going to happen. It is going to happen. It may not be on my timetable, but it will happen. So I've got a question for you today. With every eye closed, every heart open to God, I'm asking you a question. How long are you willing to hold on to a promise from God? How long? 
Because if it doesn't come to pass, it's not because of him or his ability. But do you give up too soon? Does your faith waver after a few weeks? When things don't go like you planned for it to go? When decade or two decades pass, you still are waiting in that waiting period? I've come to tell somebody, do not give up. Do not give up. God will fulfill every single promise that he has made to you. Every single promise. Every single promise. Every single promise. Can we lift our hands right now? These altars are open. I, I'm going to ask you to come because I really feel that somebody in this place, you've been, man has failed you, but God is saying, listen, if you'll put your life in the hands of a God, I'm a God that cannot lie. I am not a man that would lie. I, I, stop comparing me to, to human ability. Stop trying to tie my hands to what you think can happen or should happen or will happen. But start depending on a God that can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Come on. Hallelujah. If God said it, it's done. If God said it, it's done. You've got to believe it. You've got to believe it. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.